sure I'm unmuted. Okay, we are recording. And so what we're going to do today is we're picking up where we left off on Monday. Monday, we were trying to get this code to work. And some of you did it and are fine. And it, you got it all working, which is fine. But what we're going to do is we're going to kind of step through it as a class together because uh, I have a different idea what I want to do with uh, homework three rather than since this is not a C source code, C programming class, but we're learning a little bit about C because that's basically how a lot of the infrastructure is built. Okay. It's like the railroad tracks of computing. It's kind of important to know how it works. You may not have to tweak individual bits, but knowing how the compile works, how the warnings work, how to fix the warnings, and what happens when it crashes, that you will need to know, because that's pretty systemic across all, all um, programming languages. Okay, so first of all, I did not sleep well last night, so I'm a little tired. So if I get a little rummy and I don't quite uh, uh, follow the train of thought, it'll be worse than normal. <laughs> okay, so get this working and, or what we'll do is type this in and then your step, what we'll be doing is we are going to compile this, okay? And when we compile it as is, we get an error. And your warning may be somewhat different, but basically it's saying warning, implicit declaration of function ATOI. I don't know what it is, but did it compile? It did. So if we do LS minus L, well, notice it compiled and here it is because I called it enter one, okay? Now, will it run? So if I type in dot slash enter four, whoops, enter one. <laughs> yes, it worked. You now know what root cause failures are on so many programs that are out there in the wild because you can get things to work with warnings but what happens with the warning is there's unknown runtime behavior that you don't know what's going to happen okay so this is how they get the buffer overflows and this is how they do uh, how they pop a shell on a box okay so we have a warning error. So what do we need to do to fix that? Well, in our case, I'm going to make it easy for you, is it's saying, wait a minute, we're calling this as a built-in, but it's not in either STDIO or in foo.h. And what did some of you find when you started looking up how to use STDIO in standard C? There's an additional library we need to load to be able to remove those warnings to make things work, okay? So we'll say include. Okay, so that's the only change we've done is we've added that library. And now we're gonna compile it again, but notice I have the little star, which means I need to save it. Okay, let's go back to the compile line here and rerun my compile, no warnings. Okay, 
So we cleaned up our warnings. So our code, as far as the compiler knows, and we know as developers, we don't have any unknown behaviors. Okay. But we do have a runtime error, which we're going to get to here in a second. Okay. Now, to fix the warning, so that's step one. How do we fix warnings? Well, when you start using extended features, there's libraries you need to bring in. Now, can you make your code work with warnings? Yes. We used to do this all the time. Hey, I can get it to compile and it runs. Cool. I'll just turn it in. Well, those days are, I won't say are gone, um, but they lead to problems. And companies like Facebook and Google and the other yeah, Amazon, they won't let you get away with that. Okay. Um, because they don't want a bigger exploit. Because many years ago, there was this error, S-U-D-O edit. That's a built-in. It allows you to edit a super user on a file. There was a convoluted keystroke sequence that popped you right into shell and you pawned the box. They didn't even know it was there. Well, SSH, which we're using to connect to the Jeremy box, has been maintained for decades by two people on a volunteer basis. When this exploit happened, all of a sudden these big companies like Google, Facebook, IBM, Red Hat, we have a problem. So they put these guys on payroll so they could fix things like this, okay? So open source, great, but sometimes you're gonna get some errors and I was working with uh, Ed Walsh and he does works at Sandia Labs. And he says, when they use open source, they incorporate code, but then they put it in this sandbox black box and they run it, they stress test it. And they look for anything that goes home to the mothership that shouldn't. So when you download source code, there might be some things that are back doors or there might be some openings that are opened on purpose, like a back channel, an open port. So, caveat emptor, buyer beware. So, this is all going into this. So, again, it works. And if I put in two of them, it still works. But if I put in none of them, I get a core dump. How many get the core dump? Okay. Now, this is the part where we kind of left it on Monday. Is it how do we look at the core dump? Well, it's not like it used to be. <laughs> okay. So here's the command you need to see your core dump. Okay. You type in journal CTL dash dash user. Now, you can do a couple of things on this. There's a gazillion parameters on here. And I'm going to use dash dash no page because I know mine's really long. I have a lot of junk in here. Um, and I want to reduce the size of my screen here a little bit. So you can kind of see Notice right where it happened. Okay, I had two of them because I ran this back to back. Okay. How many are seeing their core dump in the journal control? Okay. All right. What are you looking at? Look at your neighbors and look at yours. You're going to see some differences. Look at mine. Look at yours. You see this right here, process. This is the most recent one. That was the process ID. 
Now, the process ID is what is assigned to you when you run your computer. Windows has process IDs too. You see it labeled as PID, Mac, Linux, AIX, HPUX, mainframe calls it something else, but it's the idea is I'm taking this code and I'm running it. Well, how does the kernel know what to do with it? Well, it creates this process ID and it runs in a segment of RAM and it's pointing to the addresses of where the RAM is doing its thing. Since we're all doing a very similar thing, we all get a separate chunk of RAM with different address spaces. So looking at that, how many bits are in those addresses? Lots. So you can tell by looking at that, going, oh, this is a 64-bit machine. It's not a 32-bit machine, okay? And you're running in 64-bit mode, okay? Protected mode and so on. And now it's what it's doing is you look through these numbers, you say, hey, this is what happened. This is where it was supposed to go. And I got my error. I just, there's my core dump. These core dumps, you're going, I, don't, I won't need to know this. You may not, but let me tell you how to make the big bucks. Uh, former student of ours, Cole Busby, works over at Opportune. He's making Bay Area money here in Modesto because their office is downtown. And he's kind of like their top-notch troubleshooter. And his first question to any of the people that are having troubles that are coming to him for help, he says, what are the logs? Show me the logs. Show me the log file. Because without this kind of information, you don't know what's wrong. Because what happens is the software, when you've got your stuff running on Amazon, and then you have other people's stuff, part of your computer system, say like you buy stuff from uh, Cisco or, I don't know, Fortinet, and you have other things that you've purchased that are running on your cloud instance, or maybe from Amazon. Every one of these packages that you're running has some sort of a logging capability, okay? What are the logs? What are the logs? What are the logs? This is really important. This is something you do need to walk out of here with is the, what is a log file and why do I need to know? Yes, you need to know, okay? This is, Unlike the spark plug, you can get by with not knowing what it is, but with a car, you kind of need to know what the rules of the road are, or you, like the speed limit, can you turn right on red, what's red for, yellow does not always mean speed up, okay, <laughs> all right, those, you got to know that stuff, or you're going to get yourself in trouble, with the log file, it's in that same category okay and before we go too much further i printed out a partial journal control for you to look at so just pass it either way and <laughs> we're gonna and i i trimmed off some of the data um and okay we got three here and you don't need to keep these because you'll have a bunch on your on your computer, but this is the journal control for the root user. Okay. Four. All right. Now I'm not going to bring it up on the screen because it's too too dang tiny. I guess I should have put line numbers on it. 
this is where I wish, you know, I wish Gabriel was here because I wonder if some of this activity is his. Um, he's play, you know, he's a, he's been doing network forensics and deep packet inspection for several years. So he uses this stuff all the time to be able to do his networking, Wireshark, all that stuff. Now, I want you to kind of just read it line by line and look at it. And then I will explain them as you read through. Is there anything in there that kind of stands out? Invalid user Minecraft. And what do you see? Yep, bye-bye pre-auth. What's this indicating? Somebody's brute forcing the machine. This is why you need to know log files, okay? And I won't go into super great detail on it. Uh, I'll show you how to look at them. And then on your machine of choice, Windows or otherwise, you can look at these things, okay? And you know, a quick Google search will tell you how to find it on Windows. I honestly don't remember on Windows NT, the task manager, but that was the GUI side. They had a command line version that I don't remember anymore that gave you much more detail, okay? Kind of like this. Now, as you scroll down, you see the very first one, it says invalid user administrator. Is administrator a valid user on a Windows box? It can be, that's the default. When you install uh, server 2000, whatever, the default first user is the administrator. So they, what they're doing is that there's just a big long list of users with typical passwords banging on the box. They're trying to brute force it. Okay, and Pam, underscore Unix is a subsystem that works in uh, Windows Server and on Linux and Mac that stiffens up your login security. It makes it a little harder to crack, okay? And then it says, check pass user unknown. So administrator, they tried to log in, they used some password, and I said, uh, nope, not gonna happen. But then you see the IP addresses. See all those IP addresses? Yeah, 46, 46, boy, why are they? Well, they're all coming in from the same, same IP? Yes, no, maybe. This is where you kind of have to understand your networking a little bit. When you hit the Jeremy box, it has an external IP address. Once you hit that address, it goes to the Fortinet. Each packet is inspected to make sure there's no viruses in it. And then it gets pushed down the food chain and it bounces around the switches until it ends up in that back room. So if I was to use IP port blocking, on this address, nobody would be able to access this machine, okay? Now, if you access this machine from external, how many of, well, some of you may have tried to log in with the SSH and you use the command line version on Windows or Mac to log into the box and it gives you the last IP you were logged in from. Okay, all right. Now this W or UFW stands for uncomplicated firewall. And it's a firewall that's actually blocking a MAC address and a certain type of uh, traffic, but it's truncated in this case. 
Okay, goes down again, goes down again. Invalid user Stacy received disconnect. Bye bye. And then uh, I guess it's called cron two six four one. You see root cmd dash x user lib php session clean and if it's running system d system it's trying what it's trying to do is it's actually trying to log in as the root user the they're trying to use the ph with some back doors that are well or we'll call them vulnerabilities that's in PHP code. Okay. And they're trying to get in. And then it shows you what's going on. And you keep walking your way down. You're going, oh my goodness. What is this IQ bow? Well, don't know. And so on. Minecraft, invalid user. This is how you know who's hacking on your box i can bet if you look at your router logs which are by default off go home turn them on you're going to see people hacking on your router this is why you always change the default passwords okay because a machine with a weak password can be hacked in a matter of minutes with the brute force approaches that are out there, okay? That actually happened to me a couple of semesters ago. I didn't use a strong enough password, okay? There's other ways around this by using SSH keys, okay? All right, so this is why log files are important. Now, going back to our code, all right. We now know we have some sort of a runtime error here. How would we fix it? To make sure that the user would put in at least one argument, the integer. Yep. Bingo. You just check the count in argc, make sure it's greater than or equal to one. And then you won't get that runtime error. Or you can do like Xavier did and use a case statement. Doesn't really matter. But where would you use it? Or how would you do it? And then where would you put it? So you can use uh, in C, they have something called a one line if. And this is the, uh, uh, they say, don't do it. <laughs> it's called the ternary operator, okay? Okay, <laughs> what does that mean? So when you use code like that, so we'll click on C here. Here is the uh, a traditional if else construct in C. And now you in the back probably can't see that, huh? I'm on the Wikipedia page. So this is the convention most people use. It's easier to read. But this is valid code, okay? So you can put this in if A is greater than B or so on. So you would say arg V is, you can assign it to a variable. You can do things um, like this. So here's an, a, is A equal to X? There's your ternary operator. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't, this makes a lot of sense to me. I can read that. 
even though I am not really a C programmer. Now, I do want to take a little bit tiny diversion uh, to show you something. All right, the man I was hoping would be here today. <laughs> <laughs> you're in trouble no you're not is it this is right up your um your ballywack this is the journal control and we were just looking at it because this is where the core dump goes okay and so you can add some insight to this as we're getting there okay now i want to click on Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, a little, somebody's brute forcing it, that's for sure. Um, while I'm bringing up what I want to show you, uh, Ah, perfect. I did find it. Okay. This is really going to be obtuse. Look at this right here. How many would like to debug this? This is working code. It's the input to a command called DC. And in uh, Linux, that's the, it's called DC, decimal calculator. It uses a reverse Polish notation, which means it's a stack. You're going to get into stacks and queues in your next programming class or 274, I think. Okay. So, understanding what a stack and a queue is and how they work is you got to know that. Okay. This has been around a very long time. It actually ran on the PDP 11 which was before Unix was even thought of. What? It's DC. It's the language for DC. Now, go to 99bottlesofbeer.net or Google it and browse languages and look for the language called DC. And I do believe it's the actual number 99. Yeah. Click on browse languages and go to D. Now, everything on this website does nothing but print 99 all the beer, all the beer, all the beer. And then which languages handle one bottle of beer versus one bottles of beer at the very end of the lyrics. Okay. So it shows you the command. Doesn't that make so much sense? <laughs> I was looking at this and I'm going, dang, I forgot how hard some of this stuff was. <laughs> it's things you, you just want to forget. <laughs> but let me show you, if I take this code and say copy and open a terminal window, this was 
I'll just open a new one because I've lost track of where I am. So type in DC and hit Q. There's the language. You do uh, man space DC. It shows you how it works. Okay. A gazillion long. So if I type in DC and then paste that in, hit enter. Okay, there's a little bit of an error at the bottom based on the version uh, that D this version of DC is compared to what the original code was. Because this original code was written in 2005 and DC has been touched and modified. Now, why do you care? To show you that this is the kind of thing that we came from, The part that does make sense for you is a command called BC. Remember how we were talking about we can have a single executable based on your arg zero of what you call it as? Whether it's a read only version of them or a, a version that allows you to read write. Back in the day, this was the same executable. And if you called it as BC, it gives you a much more normal interface for doing arbitrary precision arithmetic. So I can type in scale equals 10. That's going to give me 10 decimal points. And I can say, 20, uh, say x is equal to 22 divided by 7, and then just put x on a screen by itself. And you can see I get an approximation of pi there. And to get out of BC, you type in the word. This works on almost all commands. It's either Q or the word exit or the word quit. One of those three almost always works no matter what program you're working on. And in this case, it's exit. Whoops, quit. <laughs> okay. Now look at 99 bottles of beer on the wall for the language BC. Remember, as a computer science measure, you're going to write a compiler. And a compiler takes those characters that we were looking at, and it parses them, they're called tokens, and then you create your language. Can you imagine trying to parse that screen of, write a compiler for DC? How long, it, you, know, you could have a lot of crazy, it'd be quite the exercise, it would be quite the brag tag. So let's go back and look at BC. It may not be there because uh, technically, up oh, it is. It was written in 2005. Now, doesn't that make more sense? It's what? Yeah, yeah. It looks a whole. Yeah, it's, it's you can follow this code. functionally equivalent. So when you see syntax on top of this, what is it really doing? It's actually converting that, the BC part of the program is converting human readable English into that DC noise, okay? Now, I'll show you a couple of programs that I, I, I really, enjoy. this is a fun website to just look at code going, what is this? What, like this one here, this is what I had to use. I got 10 years of using this stuff. 
it's worth absolutely nothing today. I couldn't get a job for even $35 an hour to run PIC code. There's no PIC systems around, okay? They're there, but most people don't use them anymore, okay? And the difference is, if you look at COBOL, it is still being actively maintained and there are people putting money into COBOL to bring it into more modern, a more modern tool chain. That is not the case for PIC, okay? And if I look, we can go to basic here and look up basic. Let's look at how about just plain old. Oh, that's fun. How about for the Casio? This is a calculator you used to be able to control. So you can actually type, okay, kind of makes sense. It's fun to look at this stuff so you can see different programming languages, just get an idea, okay? But now let's go back to our code here and we wanna fix this, not that one. We wanna fix this one, okay? So, Let's fix it. So look up standard C if, okay? Remember our blank piece of paper? Write a for loop. It's okay to memorize a few things like a for loop and a uh, if in the language of your choice. Now, as you're looking that up, I do want to mention this in the, in the world of languages. I've worked with many over the years and there's been only one language that I personally have used where it gives me the ability to write something rather complex, put it on the shelf, forget about it. And in six months, a year, two years, go back to it and pick up where I left off. It's Python. I wrote stuff in Perl, which some of you may know. Um, I'll bring that up again. 99 bottles of beer. Whoops, that's not it. <laughs> and I'll bring up... Uh, Pearl. Anybody code in Pearl? That's what I thought. It's not used much, but it is exceptionally powerful. P E R L. I did. Ah. And some of these I've never heard of. If you go around and search through these languages, there are languages here that just mess with your head, okay? That's working Python code. Now, doesn't that make a lot of sense? Well, you can actually look at the standard version here. This is Perl, okay? But I want you to look at this these two lines here. Remember that ternary operator we were talking about? That's the default way to do if and for loops in Perl. I wrote a check fraud avoidance system in Perl in about, yeah, I don't know, a couple of weeks. It wasn't that complex. I had to harvest a bunch of registers from different computer systems that didn't talk to each other, put it in an ASCII file, and then basically do a checksum on the later columns, you know, say the four columns. So what in those days, when you cut checks, you had to tell the bank what check numbers that you printed. So somebody wouldn't come in with a double copy of the check 
and try to get paid twice, okay? And check fraud avoidance. One transaction, one check. But I worked on that thing and got it working and I had to go back and fix it. I don't even remember what the timeline was. And there was another programmer slash guru that I was working with at the time. And his name was Tom Putney. And I looked at the code and I'm going, man, Putney must have written this. This is really cool. What's it do? I'm going, oh, crap, I wrote it. What did I do? That will happen when you get too tricky in your programming to show how clever you are. Okay, don't do that. Other people have to read your code. All right, now let's fix this, okay? So look up an if statement on standard C. You could even say standard C, arg v, arg c, test, user input. And you get an answer that's really, really close. Okay. So that's what I want you to do for your final homework or homework three. It's put in an if tag, make it work. If you got it working, it's great. Then you're done. I haven't posted it yet because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with this assignment. But your walk away from this is you know what argv argc does now across languages, okay? Pretty much same thing. And then you modified some code that you really don't understand to make sure that you have one or more parameters or one and only one, and then give a message to the user saying, usage, command, integer. So that's all we're doing for homework three. Add the if statement. So what have we done so far? Well, we started off today with code that did this. It compiled with warnings, but it still ran. Okay. Then we fixed the warning. Whoops. Now you are fixing the core dump. And next Monday, we start jumping back into the debugger, okay, with this code. So we will take out some of the things that we put in so we know where to break it. So we can bring it in the debugger and look at it. And we can see the before and after of fix and broken in the debugger. Okay, so feel free to jump ahead and play with this on your own. Okay. So that's where we'll be going. And I think what I'll do is I'll just, I'll put it right here. And you can add an if or a case or some sort of thing. Doesn't really matter. Check or arg c, how about equal to one? Or, you know, equal to one and only one. And then if it is that way, then print error to user, else continue. Okay.
Now, some of you are already done with this, that's fine. Uh, I'll get it posted so you can, and basically all I need is your source code um, and a screenshot of you putting in the command with no parameters, with no core dump. Okay, so that's what I'll be looking for. So now you have 15 or so minutes to work on it. You can get your homework done and you can walk right out of the class. Now, if you were a student like I was, I would not spend a lot of time on the content between classes because as working full-time, I had two small kids, had a family, and I had weekends. But guess what? You still have to put time into the woodshed to get good at this stuff. And I happened to have employers that were pretty generous on letting me study while I was learning. Okay. That doesn't always happen. Okay. You now have the opportunity, most of you, to study focused without distractions. Okay. Seize the opportunity. <laughs> Don't do what I did. <laughs> so Gabriel, was any of this you? <laughs> yeah, if you want to ask about, yeah, if you want to ask about security and things, if you're interested in security, talk to Gabriel. He, he's a, he's got some nice deep knowledge to tap into. Oh, you can use a while loop. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, you you need a different a different exit on 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 the while loop in C. There's the do until. Yeah, there's yeah do while there's different syntax. So find out which one you want to do first. Do you want it to check before it drops through the loop, or do you want it to check and jump out of the loop? Okay, so. You want to check and just skip over it. Okay. So that's where you're headed. So look up your syntax on that. And then you just want it to stay in that loop until the user types in the correct answer. Yeah. Okay. That is not normal error behavior because if you type in a command, You can do that. I'm not saying you can't, but the convention would be like, whoops, let's not use a special symbol. It says wait, and it goes immediately out. The error on the command line doesn't get you stuck like this. If I start something, and say echo, single quote. Now what happens? You're stuck in the program and the user has to do something to get out of the program because they don't know how to get out of it. And in this case, it's a typo. And that fixed it. How would the user know that? Yeah, so it depends on it really depends on the audience. If you really want to get into error error corrections, is the if you look at the Google errors, how do you handle errors in C? It's five pages of documentation. You know, it errors out. It creates a log. It goes in blah 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 blah, so they can find out where it died. But on simple command line stuff, it's generally if it doesn't work. Here's how you use it. OK. 
Okay. But if you are writing some other program, like uh, let's say you're doing a data entry program and they have to type in 200 numbers. Well, putting in a loop makes a lot of sense. Okay. It's your call. You can do whatever you want with it. Okay. Okay. I would go for simplicity. <laughs> Have you figured out how to do this in Rust? Yeah, the argv argc. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of commonality. It's a squirrely brace, squirrely brace language. So, So your goal is to put in an if, however you want to do it, or a case. So if there's no arguments, there's no core dump. That's the direction we're taking, OK? Oh, let me get a pen here. Let's make sure this writes. Sometimes the pins in that don't always write. Uh, a little sign in sheet I just use as a fudge factor at the end of the semester. If you need an extra five points for a letter grade, I look at that. Of course, I can't do that as much now that everything's being recorded, right? So. All right, speaking of that, I will stop the recording.